Okay, ready? Here we go. All right, everybody. I am here with Clark Seipt from the Community Coalition for Haiti. And uh, we have been uh, supporting the Community Coalition for Haiti for a year or so, year and a half, something like. And uh, so we wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, hear a little bit more about it and find out how it all works and what they all do. So Clark, glad to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, the coalition here and, and uh, how to get started and, you know, stuff like that. Sure. I, I suspect that any of you that are at all familiar with our mission and ministry know that um, Community Coalition for Haiti is um, a group of very dedicated volunteers and staff and partners that stretch across Haiti and across the U.S. Um, facilitating healthcare and education ministries um, within many, many communities um, in Haiti. And we've been doing so for almost 30 years. We wow. run... Yeah, it's, it's a long-term partnership and ministry that brings um, quality health care to Haitians, um, many of whom could not afford that access um, without it. So we run a primary care center, a physical therapy rehab clinic, as well as a surgical center. And then on the education side, we also train teachers. So we work with more than 20 rural schools training their teachers, um, because we know those are the change makers in Haiti. Me or you going into a classroom in a rural mountaintop in Haiti um, might be fun and wonderful and would be a moment um, in those children's lives. But if we can train up their teachers um, to be strong and well-equipped and confident, then that truly um, is the change that's needed within that system. And then there's really cool ways that we connect those ministries as well. And I'm sure we'll get into that later on. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I've been on some short-term, you know, a week mission trip, and it's wonderful, but then you go away, and yeah, so what do they do after that? It's, yeah. it's interesting, That's and, and I'm sure we'll talk about that during this, but that is one of the roles that we feel called to play as an organization, is really helping people understand some of the negative connotations in that narrative around short-term missions, mm -hmm. but also the really healthy and impactful ways that groups can partner long-term um, to bring about change and impact as well. We're actually, you had asked about how we started, um, Pastor David, we were a joint mission project between two churches in Northern Virginia. So Vienna Presbyterian Church, who is part of the National Capital Presbytery, mm -hmm. um, came together with First Baptist Church of Vienna, which is a historically African-American church. Um, many of the members in those congregations had been part of one-time mission trips to Haiti um, in the late 80s, early 90s. And the medical group um, that was supporting some of those trips, they were largely surgically focused, had kind of run its course um, supporting that. And those churches came together and said, you know what, this is important. Let us do this together. And 30 years later, they are still active partners in our ministry, as well as a number of other churches from the National Capital Presbytery and beyond. So it's good stuff. Yeah, excellent. So how, how would you describe the, the main goals then for, for the coalition? Sure. Um, so I've touched on them just a little bit. Um, yeah. When you think about healthcare, really, we believe that everyone deserves access to care, um, but not just care. We believe that everyone deserves access to quality care. You know, there are only um, six doctors for every 10,000 people in Haiti. Wow. Yes. Wow. And most of those doctors, as you can imagine, are concentrated in urban areas. Mm hmm right? Haiti is a very mountainous nation. Um, and so access, particularly for rural communities, is, is at times non-existent, right? Mm. Um, you're also talking about just a systemic kind of evolution of a healthcare system that has left it weak, it has left it broken. I don't know if you've paid any attention to the Haitian news over the last several years, there's been a lot of volatility in it. But kind of the running undercurrents in that is um, the, the public health system, the public health care system in Haiti just kind of shutting down and going on strike. It's a broken system to begin with. And so our focus is to one, make sure that patients who need it have access to quality care. But as we do that, we also want to train Haitian healthcare providers. 
because that's how you strengthen the system overall. We don't operate in isolation. We operate right alongside those partners, whether they're the public hospital in Jack Mel, which is where we operate, or private clinics, which many of which are cost prohibitive for people, right? Or other NGOs like us. We believe that there's a role for everyone to play in terms of strengthening that system overall. And that probably echoes, um, as, as you hear me talking, you can see how our emphasis on training is also echoed in our education ministry as well. And we talked about that, why we focus on teachers. Um, but as part of that work, we also focus on healthy schools. So making them safe, right? Everybody needs access to safe infrastructure for that. Um, and, and children and community health, right? Hungry kids can't learn, right? You get them to school, but if they're hungry, if they're anemic, they can't learn. And so we feed over 700 rural school children every single school day. We take healthcare directly to those schools um, through a school-based clinics initiative that also includes huge emphasis on health education in those schools and out in the communities. And that, that public health and health education emphasis is actually the biggest area for growth um, in the years to come. Because we know that another way to, you know, target the access problem is just to prevent illness before it even happens, right? Arm people with what they need, low to no cost interventions in the home, so that maybe they, they, they prevent the need to get to an emergency place, right? We believe that by working in partnership, and I think this is something that Katakton believes as well, by working in partnership, we can do more together than we can do alone. And so that's the approach we take in Haiti, um, you know, walking right alongside our partners. We don't wanna do anything that Haitians could do for themselves. We wanna make sure that we are building capacity, building leadership, because Haiti needs its people, Haitian men, women, and children to be the change makers for the future. And then that's how we operate in the states as well, walking alongside partners like, like you and other churches, like civic groups. You know, one of the first ways I met Connie was at a Rotary meeting, right? Mm -hmm. um, through healthcare offices, through schools, um, and many others, because that's that's where the power of collaboration comes. Cool. So it's it sounds uh, sounds like a, a pretty different model than a lot of things that we're used to seeing and, and working with. Um, I, I imagine, what about the, that volatility? Uh, I mean, that's got to be really hard to work with because Haiti, I mean, it seems like uh, they've got earthquakes going on every couple of years and then in between they've got the, the government collapsing. Uh, and so how does that affect your, your work? So it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, it's the natural disasters. It's a, a very um, volatile and uncertain political climate. I mean, right now, for instance, we are preparing for what's expected to be additional unrest um, in these last couple of weeks of January rolling into February, because there's a very strong disagreement in Haiti right now around when the president's term ends. Oh. Right. So there's where it's just, it's one thing after another. And to your point, you know, that volatility and uncertainty is very hard to plan under. How do you feel about planning under uncertainty, Pastor? <laughs> We're getting it's used to something. it. <laughs> not I mean, not a fan, but getting used to it, right? All yeah. of us have had to build yeah. our skills in, right? But what we really focus on in, in that context is, is, I think, a very intentional effort to try to identify what we have control over right? Mm -hmm. As part of our mission and ministry. And as part of that, we say, okay, we do have control over maybe these 10 things to the best of our ability, right? And which of those 10 things, in which of those 10 things can we be the most impactful, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I work with a, an amazing group of Haitian leaders that lead our work on the ground day to day. We're a very small staff here in the States, um, but we employ um, almost 20, um, maybe even a little over 20 right now, Haitian men and women that lead that work. And so we just have very frank and honest conversations around, okay, so these are our priorities. These are our goals. Yes, you know, everything is in flux, but you know what we can focus on is we can focus on making this clinic consistently available to the communities that we serve. We can make them feel safe and dignified and loved when they walk in the door. We can give them the best healthcare possible. We can give them access to meds. And, and that, that simple, right? 
but also complex act is what allows us to have impact and what allows the transformation of lives that we're all aiming for. And I think being really honest about that, um, being realistic about that, but also just, just nose, nose to the ground saying, you know what, we may not have control over these 25 things, but this is what we're focusing on right now. We're gonna keep chipping away at these gains and we're gonna continue training around us. Because even if we approach a day in the future, right? Years from now, where CCH has either worked itself out of a job, right? Yeah. Right? Which, which honestly is part of the ideal goal, right? Absolutely. Um, or, you know, can't, can't exist for one reason or another. If we've done our job in training Haitian medical professionals and training Haitian educators, that, that change, that skill set, that strength stays in the system and will be perpetuated moving forward. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, so does the, uh, the fact that you're working mostly in rural areas, does that take some of the pressure off from the political stuff that's happening like in the cities and such? That's a, that's a really good question. So historically, a lot of the, the unrest and volatility that you see maybe in international news, oftentimes that is restricted in large part to Port-au-Prince, which of course is the capital um, of Haiti. And by road, where we operate, where our home base ends, which is in the southern part of the country, is about four to five hours by road um, from Port-au-Prince, separated by multiple mountain ranges, right? And so before about 2019, within my tenure, and I mean, we could go all the way back to the 90s um, with, with a lot of the history there, and I'm sure that wasn't restricted to Port-au-Prince by any means. But in terms of our tenure in the last several years, you know, initially a lot of that unrest was really focused in the capital. And being where we were, we weren't directly impacted by it. But from 2019 onward, we've seen that dynamic start to shift that we, we have to take into account all of these different things because it is impacting our work directly, it's impacting our partners directly. Um, and so our goal, of course, is to, to persist in our mission ministry to the best of our ability. And we also wanna make sure that our staff stays safe. Um, but they are smart. They are so, so smart and creative and strategic. And um, you know, just during COVID as an example, they were so dedicated to keep, keep our work going despite the challenges that continue to kind of be laid before us, right? And so that creativity and imagination, right, which is called upon all of us, um, you know, really comes into play. And I'm, and I'm thankful for it. Yeah, wow, excellent. And um, how did how did you get involved with, with the coalition then? <laughs> so, so I worked in um, Africa, all across Africa and Southeast Asia for 10 years. Before that, I was uh, working in Argentina and the Dominican Republic. I'm an environmental scientist by training. Okay. Um, rocks, actually, so geology. Um, and then I, I kind of took that and environmental management into the climate change world. And that's where I lived for about 15 years. Um, ever since I was a small child, though, I knew I wanted to work internationally. Um, the, the mission field has always been, that had this pull for me, right? And so um, about five years ago, I was running really good, strong, long-term programs in Africa, and I was largely working within universities. And I could tell you how people's lives were being changed by the work that we were doing, right? I was working with young scientists that don't typically have a seat at the table, right? I was working with African scientists who typically don't have a voice at the international scale, right? And so we were building skills and capacity in those young scientists. We were making sure they had access to the most recent literature and studies and that, and that they did have that voice, right? And it was really good work. But I also just started to feel this nudge that um, I wanted to be working much more directly on the ground. I wanted to be putting food into hungry bellies. I wanted to, you know, make sure that people had access to the health care that they needed, mothers and children and, and, and the men and women that were trying to support their families and couldn't, right? Because they were sick or they were hurt and they didn't know how to get their livelihood back. They didn't know how to get their confidence back. And so I started looking um, and the posting for um, Community Coalition for Haiti came across my desk. And I said, no way. I don't speak French. There is no way I can go work in <laughs> Haiti. This is ridiculous. Nope. And the 
but it came back across again. And you know, I, <laughs> we, we all know that God works in very intentional, sometimes quiet, sometimes really loud ways, right? And so it was this persistent, hey, knock, knock, knock. And I started talking with the board and I started talking with um, the, the volunteers that worked with CCH and had been working with CCH for many years. And the work was right there, right? Mm -hmm. We are putting food in hungry bellies. We are helping people get their livelihoods back through healthcare and education and, you know, this type of collaborative work. And the work that I had been doing for the entire rest of my professional career was focused on leadership and building skills in country. And mm. so where they did, they, they had that emphasis, but it wasn't well developed, right? And so I brought a skill set that helped to just ramp that up. And we've been doing it now uh, for five years and it's good work. It's very good work. Cool, excellent. So you've been with them for just five years? Yep. Okay, okay. Wow. Uh, so what's the biggest change that you've seen in those five years? Ooh, that's a good one. I have seen um, our in-country team, right? So we have an in-country director who's amazing. I hope you get to meet him one day. He he often comes to the to the to the states, and we've had him speak at St. Andrews, spoken at Vienna. He's been. I would love for him to meet the Catoctin community. He leads a team of. Um, these men and women in Haiti, who I said before, are just so dedicated to this mission. And the biggest change that I have seen over the last five years is we transitioned from an organization that was highly reliant on volunteer teams coming down, right? And there is such value in that. And I hope we get to that in this conversation, Pastor sure. David, because there is, there's such value in that. There's a richness in the ability to work together in that very tangible way um, and the implications it has for when we come home, right? For, for being advocates for social justice and for telling Haiti's story and for combating this narrative around the evils of short-term missions. So I hope we get there, but the, the team in Haiti kind of saw their role as, as a support role, right? Where the, the work was led by those teams. And in the five years that we've spent working together, that team in Haiti has become our, they have become our primary hands and feet on the ground right? Yeah. They've always, they've always been in it and implementing it, but they have been equipped and empowered in ways that I just think are so illustrative of the values um, and the true mission that this, this group is aligned with, right? Mm -hmm. We want to equip and empower one another to lead, to achieve, and to inspire, right? And um, I'm just so impressed with them. And I think the last 18 months, which have been full of volatility and uncertainty, right? Um, has has necessitated them to see their role differently. And so that, sh that shift in mindset, which only just makes this work more impactful. Yeah, yeah. Um, you are a Presbyterian elder and a I member at, at St. Andrew, right? Yeah, um, right down the road. Yeah. So um, before we get too local, is there any connection between the coalition and the denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA and, and its mission work? Um, so in a couple of different ways, yes. Um, so in terms of our presbytery, so the National Capital Presbytery of PCUSA, um, the Community Coalition for Haiti is named as a mission highlight partner by the presbytery. And we are so honored um, to receive that recognition. Um, we are also named as the Haiti Network for the presbytery. So for the congregations that are interested in um, working in Haiti in learning about Haiti and partnering with other congregations that have those similar interests, CCH serves as, as kind of that, that connector role, right? To, to, help, to help churches within our presbytery try to figure out how to plug in. There's similar types of networks for Kenya and um, uh, there may be one for Syria now as well, but so we we stay very closely connected with the NCP, and as I think I mentioned earlier, work with a number of congregations within the Presbytery. In terms of direct ties to the big church, right, PCUSA, um, we we are you know very actively engaged in a lot of the the mission 
foci that PCUSA has named. And I don't know if, is your community um, familiar with Cindy Carell? She is the, the mission co-worker for Haiti that is commissioned by the PCUSA. Do you know Cindy at all? Oh. No. Okay. So we've recently gotten connected with her just in the last two years, and she's phenomenal. She's mm. just wonderful. And so I'll have her come in and run board retreats for my board, you know, work with my staff to, to, to challenge us in ways that just help us to make those connections better. The last retreat that she ran for us, we, we dug into the roots, the root causes of poverty. Mm. which kind of speaks to this long-term transformational approach to ministry, right? Where you can, you can keep doing all this great work, these programs, these ministries, you know, all these projects that show, show true impact in people's lives. But if we're not digging into the roots of what maybe has caused some of these systemic inequalities in the past, or what has, mm. has really um, seeded the perspectives that we have and that Haitians have of our partnership together, then we're, we're missing the ball a little bit, right? We're missing the mark. And so that connection has been a wonderful one that has grown in the last couple of years. Um, and, and I look forward to, to maintaining it and strengthening it moving forward. Yeah. Well, we've uh, recently signed on for the Matthew 25 initiative with the PCUSA, which focuses on community engagement, uh, working against systemic racism and systemic poverty. It sounds a little bit like the work that you're doing <laughs> well maybe right I am. where we are so at saint andrew we are entering into a lenten series that's exploring um you know what what i think the church is calling us to be as matthew 25 congregation so i'm really excited about it i don't know um very deeply the, the movement and the initiative and the call, but I've, you know, I've begun to read some of that as, as we as leaders in the church start to plan for it. And I think you're right. I mean, I think when it comes to Haiti, um, you wouldn't think that uh, um, maybe racism is the same sort of problem or challenge as it is here, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's an it's a island nation of 11 million people descended from slaves, right? That were actually the first, the first country to um, secure their independence from slavery. I mean, it was amazing. There was there, the slaves. I mean, it was amazing if you read the history of Haiti. And so you, you might think, well, no, you know, systemic racism isn't an issue there, but it is, right? Because you look at how countries develop and maybe in Haiti, you would refer to it as um, systemic classism. Maybe that would make more sense, but Haiti, like many other places around our globe, but I think Haiti's challenges in this respect are, are intensified in, in very real and hurtful ways. Haiti is one of those nations where you have a very, very small, very, very small upper crust, right? Mm. The wealth in that nation sits in a very, very just teeny tiny percentage of the population. And then you have this large, large, um, large part of the population that just has very little access to any of the things that you and I might think of as simple human rights, mm. right? I mean, that's an issue. It's an issue of classism, the, the discrepancies there and how that power is wielded by just a few, right? It's an issue of, um, I mean, I think the systemic inequalities that are presented by broken national systems, right? It, that's that's the thing with the solutions, right? So you can see this stark divide, whether it's access to wealth, access to healthcare, access to education, um, whatever it is, right? And that that very clear divide presents a major issue there. But if you also don't have the systems in place, the infrastructure in place to help resolve that, then that divide just widens every single day and every single year. And that's what I think we face in Haiti. And that's where our emphasis on leadership and building um, strong Christian leadership for the future. Um, I think that's how we really think of um, changing that moving down the road, right? It's, it's, it's encouraging, you know, critical thinking and creative thinking, which aren't taught in Haiti, right? It's encouraging people to sit and work through their resolutions together, their, their, their challenges together. Um, instead of seeking out violence, right? 
it's building up those systems, whatever they may be with strong trained leaders that can perpetuate that change moving forward. And it's having honest, clear conversations building up those skills, which may seem so simplistic and so far from what you're talking about with the Matthew 25 church, but it's sometimes you got to start with simply naming the injustices, right? Mm -hmm. Naming them, putting them out on the table and, and going from there. And I feel like that's what some of our work does. It helps people realize that this is not, um, you know, these divides are not something that existed 200, 300 years ago, right? They exist right now. And it's not something that exists way around the globe in a place that you'll never, you'll never be exposed to. Haiti's less than a thousand miles from the States, right? Things that Haiti deals with. I mean, it's just think about and one more thing and then we can move on, but HPV and cervical cancer. Mm. Um, This might seem like a weird connection, but roll with me, right? Haiti has the highest incidence of cervical cancer in the Western hemisphere. It is the number one cancer killer of women in Haiti. Really? Yes. And we here in the States, less than a thousand miles away, have all but eradicated HPV, which is the primary cause of cervical cancer in the States with a simple vaccine, right? Mm. That's a systemic inequality when you think about Mm. something that simple, but yet there's places in the world that can't even dream of access to that right now. How can we as church partners, how can we as mission partners, how can we as human partners, right? Figuring out how to walk this walk in the lives that we've been given, address those inequalities. And again, sometimes it starts with just naming them. Well, I, I, I want to go one of two different ways here. One, and I want to hit both of them eventually. One is, uh, I don't know, I guess let's start with, you mentioned how your your faith influenced uh, getting into the position. Uh, how how has your faith been affected by the work? Uh, yeah, um, I I mean clearly it's been strengthened, right? I I was raised in the church. I am a <laughs> a Presbyterian born and bred. And I think all of us go through, right? All of us in our lives go through that cycle where even if you're brought up in the church, right? You 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 have to work hard and in very intentional and personal ways to develop your personal relationship with Christ. And it's through some of your experiences in your life that I think opportunities are presented in that. I think struggles are part of that. I think that, um, you know, gifts and, and choices are part of that. And I had felt, as I mentioned before, for a very long time, that that pull towards mission work. And of course, my understanding of that as a child and my understanding of that now as a leader who facilitates mission work, a leader who facilitates co-work and partnership um, is very different, but it's always been a draw for me. And in many ways, I struggled, honestly, as I was making that transition five, six years ago, um, which I shared with you, but part of it too was um, I was trying to figure out which way to go, right? I have this background in science training. I have this background in nonprofit management. Part of my skill set is taking really small organizations that are messy and getting them to a place where they're strong and they have a good foundation. And so that was very attractive to me, but I was also kind of feeling a pull towards ministry and trying to figure that out as a young mom and all of those things. And when I came to CCH, when I made the choice to come to CCH, God quickly assured me um, through a variety of experiences I had in those first one or two years that, hey, Clark, this is your ministry right now. You, you are in ministry, right? Yeah. Yeah. You might not have gone to seminary. You might not be leading a church from the pulpit, which we all know good pastors don't just lead from the pulpit, right? They roll up their sleeves and they get into it but this is my ministry right now. And if there's not a better way to strengthen your faith, to challenge your faith, right? To show you these very clear illustrations of God at work in the, in the world, to challenge you to not only act in the ways that Christ taught us to act, but also think 
<laughs> in the ways that that Christ challenged us to think. I mean, I am living every single day, um, you know, some of this scripture. I just shared a devotion with my staff last week. It's, I think it's actually written on my board still. Hold on. Yeah, it's from Romans 15, five, where it talks about the attitude of mind, right? And that's, that was like this, this thing for us a couple of weeks ago was we're not only walking the walk and talking the talk, right? But Christ challenged us to have this attitude of mind with everything that comes to us. He taught us how to do it, right? And so leading work like this um, has challenged me and strengthened me in ways that I never thought, you know, would, would be part of my work. So the other part then is, what can we do? How can we be involved in the work of the coalition? We would, I mean, we would love that. And I honestly, part of my approach to figuring out how CCH works best with partners like Catoctin is I want to learn more about what you are most interested in, right? I know that you are a Matthew 25 church now. Let's, let's dig into that and figure out how this work might relate. We are always always excited to brainstorm and, um, you know, think creatively about ways that we can do more again, that we couldn't do separately. Mm -hmm. Um, we aren't taking teams to Haiti right now. Um, it's not safe sure. um, because of COVID because of political unrest. Um, we very much look forward to the day when teams can return. I'm glad this, this came up because like I said, we are led by this amazing team in Haiti that even their own perspective of their jobs and their role in this work has changed, particularly in the last 18 months. But teams enrich that work in really powerful ways, right? And CCH is an organization that doesn't just create work for its teams to do, right? We don't say, oh, well, Catoctin's bringing down a team, better, better think of some projects for them to do, right? <laughs> exactly. We say, all right, we are partners in this for the long term. These are our goals currently, how, how can Catoctin help with those, right? How can the work that you can help us carry out here in the States and in Haiti on the ground help us to advance those goals? And so we would welcome you guys when it's safe to travel down with us. Um, I think that also gives you the opportunity, you, you know, you, we, we can talk about the mission, we can learn about the mission, but to see it, to touch it, to smell it, right? To, to hear it, that just gives you this really personal insight into the work and the people, um, the goals, the dreams, right? And so I would encourage us to think about that moving forward. That might be a youth team. It might be a mixed youth and adult team. It might be a medical team or an educator team. We've got all sorts of ways that you can get engaged with the work on the ground. So that's one thing I would think about. The other thing is, um, you know, let's think about what we can do here together stateside, right? How do we advocate for this work together? How can you help us tell our stories, right? And, and maybe that starts with these sorts of exchanges where we share stories within your community first. And something might, you know, really inspire the members sitting on one of those pews behind you. And that person's going to tell somebody else. And that's part of the walk too, is just getting the word out about the good, but also the frustrating, right? These sorts of inequalities that we talked about. And from that comes the creativity and imagination. You can tell I'm an elder, right? Yep. The creativity and imagination that then just inspires and spurs on these ideas for work that just, again, just continues to advance these goals. Um, we encourage you to pray for our work. We wanna pray for you and we ask you to pray for us. Um, again, celebrating the joys and the wins, um, but also praying us through some of these struggles. Um, I do anticipate that 2021 um, is going to be a challenge, right? I think all of us know that 2020 was atypical, mm. but it, I think that sort of that experience in 2021 is also going to spill over into 20 or experience in 2020 is going to spill over into 21 in ways that we might not be expecting, right? whether it's because of just this inherent fatigue or an expectation that things are gonna to return to the same to normal quickly and the disappointment that comes on the other side of that, right? Yeah. Um, so in, in praying for one another through that, and then also finding really cool ways for you to support the work financially, but also with your hands here in the States, right? Like, do we put together, I, I'm completely brainstorming off the cuff, right? But you know, we work with Days for Girls in, in putting out um, 
reusable uh, feminine hygiene kits for young women who are starting their cycles. And many of them, there's this high percentage of young women that drop out of school at that stage because they don't have access to what they need. You know, we have some congregations that we work with that have these groups of seamstresses within their congregation that, that sew reusable products mm. and get to Haiti. We've had other groups um, that have worked with their children's ministries, right? To talk about the importance of books, right? Or hand washing stations in the schools and they incorporate some sort of project in their Bible school or their ongoing Christian ed on Sunday mornings, right? To work towards goals that the kids, the kids set and, and as they work towards those goals, they learn about the mission all at the same time. We have people that hold parties, that tell the stories, that get people engaged, that help us make connections, you know? And so I think there's many ways that you can work with us. There's many ways that we can work with you. And I would love the opportunity to explore that even further. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Uh, is, is there a... a, a... An explicit Christian emphasis then through the work that you're doing there, like, hey, we're we're Christians and we want you to be too, kind of thing. Or, well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna rework your words just a little bit. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, are yeah. we are known as a Christian organization, and we are that is how we were founded. That is um, the faith that guides us, and we are a Christian organization and known as such in Haiti. Um, we are not exclusive though, in terms of who can participate in or benefit from our ministries, right? So these teams that I talked about, we have had wonderful groups, interfaith groups of, of medical professionals that have come down and joined forces to provide pro bono surgical care for the men and women and children that we serve, right? And you know, as well as I do this, those interfaith conversations can be so powerful, right? Yeah. We've had, um, you know, all, all members of all faiths join with us in Haiti. We've had people with no faith join with us in Haiti. And I think all of us are transformed through those experiences. Um, we also are not exclusive in, in who we serve in Haiti. We never require our patients to become Christians or profess their Christian faith. Um, you know, we are, we are open to all because that is, that is what we are called to, to, to go love serve, right? That's our mm. thing. See my shirt? Yeah, yeah. No so love serve. Um, that's that's who we are. Um, and it's interesting. There are there are different groups that approach that in different ways. And um, you know, there's so much good work done throughout the world, throughout Haiti. And this is our approach to it. We believe that we um, lead by example, right? We serve with love and kindness and um, just unconditionally put out the love of Christ. Sometimes that, that brings us to conversations with, um, you know, a mother in a rural mountaintop that says, can you tell me more about this? Right? It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to have a conversation, um, but we would never require, we're never exclusive in, in that respect. Yeah. Well, that sounds like good Presbyterian evangelism. <laughs> you know. Presbyterian born and bred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, I think that's my list. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's very cool. Any questions that you have? I, I don't know if I have any answers at all about anything, but any questions you'd have back for us? Um, I, you know, I've learned a lot about Catoctin through you, Pastor David, through talking with Connie, but um, I really would welcome the opportunity to meet more of you, to learn more about um, what your, what your congregation is passionate about, you know, the challenges that you see and the obstacles maybe ahead of you in terms of turning that passion into action. You know, if there's any ways we can help with that. One of the one of our big foci with our teams and with the partners that we work with is, is what role can we play as an organization, as a ministry in preparing our teams, right? In healthy ways, in supporting them as they work with us. And then when it comes to trips in, in equipping those teams to apply their, their experiences, to apply their lessons when they get home. And so, um, you know, if there are specific obstacles or questions or, or frustrations that you've experienced to date and think would be relevant to a potential partnership, an expanded partnership with us, I would love to just dig into those with you, right? Um, and then also, you know, as particularly as you continue along your Matthew 25 journey, help me understand what you're focusing on. Help me understand how we may 
partner together in really powerful ways um, along that journey. Um, I think I'll have more questions um, as we get to know those things better. Um, but I am, I'm one of those people that loves to just sit and get to know each other. And um, I firmly believe that it's out of those sorts of communal participatory experiences that some of the best opportunities emerge. And so I just, I challenge us both and other members of your congregation to really be intentional around exploring that in the months and years to come. Great. Fantastic. Well, and I'm just down the road, so it makes it easy. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, because your your office, your home office, is right right here, isn't it? And uh, right. we don't we don't have an office stateside, right? So we work out of our homes. Um, Pre COVID, okay. sometimes we would meet up in coffee shops and stuff like that. But um, I'm right here in Percival. Um, you know, I could I could hop on the road and be to you quickly. So yeah. always always happy to meet for coffee. Um, you know, Post COVID, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I look forward to exploring this more and I thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Clark. It's been a delight to, to talk with you and to hear more about the Community Coalition for Haiti. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to support it. Um, one of the reasons that, that we chose it was um, because of the emphasis on, on hunger and education, which are really important to our congregation. And, um, and and healthcare, of course, and and the fact that you're right here, so and and got these Presbyterian roots. So that's we're, right. And we're, also, if you do have educators, anyone who wants to be involved in that, there's been this amazing flurry of um, you know, similar to how we've all had to pivot, right, when it comes to online versus in person education and ministry. And Our uh, education team typically travels to Haiti four times per year. They stay two, two weeks at a time and work in the schools, providing training and mentorship to these teachers. They have converted 100% to a digital platform right now, wow. which is not, not an easy feat, right? Stateside or Haiti. And so yeah. um, we would welcome the opportunity to engage right now with some of your educators, retired educators, folks that are interested in education. Um, to, to get engaged in that. We're developing lessons. The teachers are telling us what they want trained in. And then we're taking those lessons and putting them into a catalog that our Haiti staff are turning about and training others with. So oh, I'd love great. to talk about that more moving forward as well. Yeah, because we have a lot of educators in our church, so. I'm married to one. They're good people. They're, they're pretty good people, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Clark, so much. It's been, as I said, it's a pleasure to talk with you, and I'm looking forward to uh, all the things that God has in store for us. Absolutely. Thank you again. Cool. All right. That sounds pretty good. All right. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. Now I have to figure out how to get that down to like eight minutes. Right. <laughs> what do you use? What platform do you use for your video stuff? Uh I movie. Oh, okay. So okay. You yeah, should just cut clips. Yeah. It'll you work. have any suggestions? For we we use we video. Oh, okay. Yeah. It yeah. works just the same. Yeah. Uh, I never could quite figure out I I movie. But um yeah. It it used to be awesome and then then they destroyed all their programs. They're awful. <laughs> <laughs> But when they were trying to make everything across the, you know, whichever platform you were on, either your laptop or your phone or your tablet, when they tried to make it so that it was all the same, it was awful. Oh. Uh, I don't like it. But I've gotten used to it. So I can. Well, that's the thing. Once you get familiar with the platform, we used, I used, um, what did I use for a long time? And then just didn't have access to it anymore. So with all of this, I've learned we video, right? Yeah. Because I don't know if you, I don't know if you've seen any of these. My family has been putting out Sunday school lessons for St. Andrew. Oh, okay. We also retold the Christmas story for the Christmas Eve service. And so it's, you know, my children are so flexible, but I'm like, well, I'm just giving you lots of, of fodder for therapy later in life. Right? <laughs> my mom made me like week after week, made me stand in front of a green screen and act out Bible stories. And, and we've had a, we've had a wonderful time doing this. It's been wonderful. We've done the Exodus. We've, I mean, we've just taken all these stories and I dress up my children and make them act crazy. And it's been wonderful. So that's how I've learned we video. <laughs> yeah. Well, the fellow that's doing our Sunday school lessons is using we video. Oh, is he? Yeah. 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 
Yeah. So, well, enjoy. I'm sure you can get it down. Oh, I'll, I'll work it out. It, it's all good. So, yeah, speaking of green screens. Um... <laughs> there you go. Yeah, my my daughter, when she was in middle school, painted her room this color. And uh, there you go. It works perfectly then. Yeah, she's 28 now, but <laughs> and doesn't she lives in Pittsburgh, but uh, we okay. still have the we still have the studio. So <laughs> there you go. Handy. Yeah, we <laughs> have we have one of them that hangs. And so our, our front foyer in our house becomes the stage. And it's just it's a riot every single time we do it. And they're like, well, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, but you do. And they love it. You know, ask, ask Dave, though. Ask Dave Milam. He, it's been a hoot, but it's it's been fun. And it's getting them engaged in church in ways that they weren't engaged before, which, yeah. you know, I dig. So, yeah. I don't know. Crazy times call for creative solutions. They so. do indeed. But thank you for this. And kind of let me know if you need anything else. Let me know where you want to go from here. I know it's hard to meet and talk and do all those things now, but I do. I I yeah. I, I am very eager to to just get to know your community. Well, good, and I, I'm excited about the possibilities. And uh, we, you know, we're over 250 years old. This congregation. So, uh, as um, the first pastor I worked with, um, he told me that you know the church is a lot like a glacier. If it, if it moves an inch a year, you're doing pretty good, you know, and uh, with with 250 year long roots, uh, sometimes it takes a little while, you know. But, wow. Uh, I did uh, not, I did not know that. How long have you been there? Uh, just past 17 years. 17, okay. Yeah, okay. so into my 18th year now. Yeah. Last week, actually, was my. Uh, Congratulations. Very good. Very good. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe it's been that long. Right. Time just whew. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Well, thank I, was, you. I was a young man when I came here. Still a young man. Oh, You're bless still a you. young man. Bless your heart. You're sweet. I'm approaching a big birthday and I'm still a young woman. So Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> what what are you approaching? Ah, that's a rude 40. 40. 40? 40. Coming. 40? coming, yep. 40 is <laughs> nothing. You're a kid. <laughs> I don't know this past year though I think has aged all of us a little yeah. bit more yeah yeah definitely it's hard to believe we've I I talking about time passing you know we're approaching the year mark where everything shut down and yeah. that that has been hard for me to yeah. turn in my head yeah and you know, I heard Dr. Fauci saying yesterday well by fall we might have some semblance of normalcy <laughs> okay I, I have three young kids also so right <laughs> but they are resilient and that you know i was back in the was it the fall or maybe even the summer you know i was doing some reading around resiliency and optimism like trying to find something to write and it was whatever i read talked about how you can't truly to be truly resilient you can't put a deadline on your optimism Right. And so we've just, I think we've gotten out of the practice. Initially, it was like, well, we got to get to Easter. And then it was, let's right. get to the beginning of June. And surely by the end of summer. So I feel like we're yeah. in this groove. And my prayer for our nation is that we just now like dig in and do what it takes to, to move past it. Yeah. 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 That's exactly what we've been through over here as well we'll be we can open for easter can't we it's, uh, no uh, you know and it, just like right. you said, we we were even thinking that we'd do an in-person christmas eve and it's, you know. we met on the steps but it was still yeah. live streamed so i i don't know how many people we had it was a small number that gathered across three services um, I, there was talk last night at session about hopefully having an outdoor service at Easter, but I don't know. We have a, there's a young woman on our session now that's a nurse at Anova and she's like, I don't, I'm not yeah. as hopeful as the rest of you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think it was Connie said, uh, February and March are supposed to be the worst months yet. Yeah. So, uh, the UVA model has us peaking here towards the end of February. Okay. So we'll see. We'll Again. see. Yeah, peaking again. <laughs> yeah. I know. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Clark. Uh, delightful to talk with you. And, and um, th this is going to be great. We'll, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll just make it the sermon so, uh, one week. That, that would be all there right. You go. Then you <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank so, you so much. All right. We'll be in touch. All right. Sounds good. Have a good weekend. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.